Hello, and welcome to Revitalizing Navajo and Hopi Energy Communities. My name is Briggs White. I'm the Deputy Executive Director of the Interagency Working Group on Coal and Power Plant Communities and Economic Revitalization. Uh, a strong welcome to this discussion, and we're really looking forward to having your participation here. Let's go to the next slide. So a brief uh, agenda overview, and as a reminder, this uh, event is being recorded, uh, and the recording and the slides will be available afterwards uh, for anyone that's interested to take another look. Uh, as an agenda overview, uh, after this brief welcome, we will have some opening remarks from Brian Anderson, the executive director of the interagency working group, as well as distinguished guests. We will then have uh, a federal panel uh, where we will have experts from a handful of federal funding opportunities or federal federal agencies uh, that will be available to share information as well as to engage in a, a dialogue uh, with the audience. We hope to have a robust uh, Q&A session, and then we'll go and do some closing remarks and the program will conclude. Next slide. So some logistical considerations. Um, all attendees are muted uh, to start, um, but you can raise your hand to be unmuted and ask uh, a question during the Q&A session only. Uh, if you're participating by phone, uh, you can do that by pressing star three, and that'll raise your hand, and you'll be notified when you have permission to unmute by pressing star six. Uh, on, on the web, you can hit the smiley button, and that will raise your hand, and then we, a moderator, will call on you to, uh, uh, to engage. Uh, so uh, star three on the phone, and the smiley for participating on the web. Uh, if you do want to enter a comment or a question, uh, we would certainly encourage you to do that. And you can do that through the chat box uh, on the bottom right hand corner of the screen. Uh, if you have if you have technical issues, please direct your question in the chat specifically to the host. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, the slides and recording, as I said, will be posted and those will be on energycommunities.netl.doe.gov. That's the web address for that and also sent by email. Uh, to anyone that registered or otherwise participated in this event. Next slide. So before I uh, hand it off, uh, just a, a brief review. Uh, we will have opening remarks by Brian Anderson, the Executive Director of the Energy Communities Energy, uh, Interagency Working Group. He's also the Director of DOE's National Energy Technology Laboratory. And after a few remarks, he will introduce our distinguished guests, as you can see on the slide. Next slide. And I think that that's my cue to go ahead and introduce uh, Dr. Brian Anderson. So, uh, Dr. Anderson, would you like to uh, say a few words about the interagency working group? Absolutely, Briggs. Thank you, and and uh, thanks to all who's joining us here today. It's really a pleasure uh, to be uh, in uh, in this meeting today with the uh, Navajo and Hopi Nations. Uh, it's been a, a little bit over 20 years since the last time I was on. Uh, on, on Hopi land and, and Navajo land, and I, I do wish that we could have been there in person today, uh, but we'll make the, make the best of it uh, in, in the virtual environment. I want to keep my comments brief uh, because as uh, we've, we've discussed, we want to make sure that uh, the community engagement, uh, specifically uh, this meeting today and our future engagement, is really focused on uh, hearing uh, from you and uh, and and it being a two way communication, and so uh, I'm going to quickly go through some slides. Brian, go ahead to the next the next slide. Our charter in the interagency working group uh, came from the executive order 14008, uh, which was the uh, executive order to tackle the climate crisis domestically and abroad, and and it's a focus of the administration of the president and and 11 federal agencies to come together as a, a whole of government uh, approach to revitalizing and uh, diversifying the economies of coal power plants and energy communities across the country. And certainly uh, the, the tribal lands uh, have a tremendous opportunity for renewable energy, uh, but also a historic dependence on, on coal, coal mining, coal power production. And we're very familiar uh, with the Navajo generating station. And so as part of our initial work, uh, the first 60 days after the executive order was a report uh, that is really just the initial report to first identify the priority communities, including those uh, here today, 
for us to provide a focus on and also to identify the federal resources that can be applied uh, to revitalizing energy communities economy. And so the focus is on catalyzing a robust economic activity and supporting workers in the energy sector. And next slide. So we were doing it from a whole government approach uh, with uh, these 11 agencies, including the, the Department of Interior, uh, Department of Labor, Education, Department of Energy, uh, and uh, many others. But again, the focus is on the priority communities, including those here today. And coal communities that um, identified were are the ones that are immediately challenged, either because of coal retirements, coal, uh, coal mine closures, or um, uh, pending uh, coal plant and coal, coal mine closures. So there's more analyses that are forthcoming, but the real focus of identifying these priority communities is so that we can spend a lot of our time engaging directly uh, with communities like, like today, but this is only a start uh, with our engagement uh, uh, with you. So then the next slide, the focus for us is targeting the right investments from the federal government so that they can catalyze economic revitalization, diversification, and our job on the, on the uh, federal government side is to coordinate across the government and, and uh, bring these federal dollars to bear. We identify $38 billion in funding across 60 different authorities existing uh, in the federal government today. And our job is to make sure that they're coordinated so we can catalyze investment targeted specifically to those communities. And then the last uh, two points, uh, the next slide, um, is that uh, we want to stay engaged. Uh, Briggs already mentioned the, uh, the website, energycommunities.metl.doe.gov, uh, but it really is about creating a, this two-way dialogue for us uh, to engage directly uh, with communities, community leaders, and workers in the energy space. And so lastly, on the last slide is a, a call to action. It's a call to action for us to stay engaged with stakeholders, uh, for us to uh, continually listen to the needs of communities, and for us to help support coalitions that uh, can put together the matching funds that are often necessary uh, for federal funding. We'll get, we'll get into some of those specifics. But lastly, and, and really most importantly, is so that the communities can provide input into our priority work streams. Uh, certainly, stakeholder engagement is one vehicle we can do it, uh, but we want to make sure that we are targeting the right federal investments, that we're lowering the, bar the barrier that is often felt by heavily impacted communities. Uh, and to do that, we're working on capacity building in the communities as well as, as a one-stop shop. So with that, I'm going to end my in in my formal comments. We can bring down the slideshow uh, because it is really uh, a pleasure to be here with you today, and uh, it is my great honor to introduce uh, uh, our next speaker. I want to thank you, uh, uh, President Nez, for joining us today. Uh, as many of you know, and most of you know on on the call, uh, President Jonathan Nez began his service to the public after being elected. As the Shanto chapter vice president, he was later elected to serve three terms as a Navajo Nation council delegate, representing four different chapters. He was also elected as the Navajo County Board of, uh, Board of Supervisor and served two terms. And, and in 2015, President Nez was elected Navajo Nation vice president. With a strong belief in education, he has completed doctoral level research on local empowerment and mobilizing communities of the Navajo Nation to reinstate their inherent local way of governance. So I'll pass it over to you, uh, President Nez, and it is a great pleasure to meet you and a great pleasure to be here with you today. Well, thank you, Brian, and thank you to the U.S. Department of Energy, the, the National uh, Energy Technology Laboratory, and also the Interagency Working Group. I know that there are many partners uh, putting on this event, and I ask, uh, and I thank you actually for the opportunity to, you know, give you a quick overview. Uh, I'm sharing the stage here with uh, fellow speakers. We appreciate the leadership of uh, OP Chairman uh, Timothy Navongyama, uh, U.S. Congressman Tom O'Halloran, uh, U.S. Department of Energy staff, and 
those that are watching, we welcome you to this event. The Navajo Nation's uh, key component of economic capital is the workforce, just as it is in any government. The Navajo people have a strong dedication to work and maintain a long-term commitment to a job. Uh, larger industries like the former Navajo generating station and Peabody coal mine have contributed over 1,000 jobs to Navajo and Hopi citizens. The direct value of employment estimated at $128 million uh, annual in paychecks, uh, annual to their employees. The average annual salary was uh, nine, 99,900. Uh, with the absence of the industry, the strategy has been to prioritize, <clears throat> excuse me, migrating to other Navajo industries, such as renewable development, tourism, and agriculture. So there is this transition and it all, it all began with uh, our administration in embracing this transition. Of course, we didn't have much choice with the closure of the Navajo Generating Station and the mines in up in Black Mesa. Um, you know, I, I want to also highlight uh, our meeting with uh, uh, Wahela Johns and the Secretary of Energy, Jennifer Granholm, who visited the Navajo Nation uh and visited the four corners power plant uh, that power plant is uh beginning to transition into regional operation and then eventually will shut down those that were there in attendance uh or u.s senator martin heinrich uh new mexico congresswoman Teresa ledger fernandez and we did discuss the proclamation in April of 2019, uh, we signed the Navajo Hayokas or Navajo Sunrise Proclamation to create a new economic vision for the Navajo people through healing the land, fostering clean energy development, and providing leadership for energy market for the Navajo people. Since then, we have uh, taken steps to transition from fossil fuel development to renewable energy. Um, and some of those projects, we have the Kianta Solar Farm 1 and 2, which generates 55 megawatts of electricity and help electrify some of our Navajo homes. Others on the plan are the Cameron, Cameron Red Mesa, Fichi in Arizona, and also the, <clears throat> excuse me, the Bistai Solar Farm in New Mexico and other uh, prelim preliminary discussions on additional uh, renewable energy projects on the Navajo Nation. The Hayoskoff Proclamation has set the tone for the Navajo Nation's renewable energy priorities. We have uh, supported partners at the state and federal levels who are working with uh, the Navajo Nation to develop more projects that create jobs, revenue, and sustainable energy foundation for our people. And we did, and we do appreciate Secretary Granholm's visit to the Navajo Nation and the resources that may be available to uh, Coal impacted communities as there is funding available in the amount of $300 million. And that is going to be uh, a great shot in the arm for uh, communities such as the Navajo Nation to begin to transition into renewable. But we look forward uh, to discussing and developing our. our uh, packet for possible um, funding through federal government. Lastly, I just want to say that, you know, Navajo Nation and other tribes have 
contributed greatly to this country. Uh, for us in Arizona and the Southwest, the Navajo Nation have helped uh, the region, the Southwest, in providing inexpensive power. And so now, more than ever, we need uh, partners, rather than just saying you guys are on your own, to be a part of this transition to help tribes move into possibly being uh, a big part of renewable energy development in the Southwest. And we have done so uh, with the Arizona Corporate Commission, uh, letting them know that uh, we are fine. Over 27,000 square miles of Navajo land, we have the ability to provide renewable energy, this clean power to jurisdictions and, and even companies, uh, green energy. And we look forward to working with uh, everyone that's uh, at Department of Energy, including the secretary, as well as those that may be interested uh, that are on this uh, event, the WebEx event today. So I'll end there and thank you for the opportunity to, to share a little bit about what's happening here on the Navajo Nation. Thank you. President Mez, thank thank you so much, and and uh, and we we really do take it to heart, as you mentioned. Uh, it's a partnership. Uh, I think that uh, there are uh, differences and similarities in in the energy communities that we see all across the country, and uh, it is it is imperative that we uh, get to know uh, the the future, uh, the vision uh, from each community as well as the assets. And, and thank you so much for reminding everyone that the assets uh, is the labor force. But the asset in, in, in the tribal communities are the labor, labor force, and that is a high priority for us in the interagency working group. So thank, thanks again. I'm also very pleased to be joined by the Hopi Tribal Chairman, Timothy uh, uh, Nodungima. Sorry about that. Um, and, and so Chairman, uh, the chairman was elected uh, the Hopi tribe in 2017 and had a mission uh, to build a sustainable and diverse economy, ensuring that the Hopi tribal government is responsive to the voices and needs of its people. Prior to becoming chairman, uh, Chair Chairman Nobunima worked in finance and as a wildland firefighter. In addition, he was a volunteer for KUYI, the Hopi reservation based radio station, which strives to reaffirm respect for tradition by preserving language and culture in a contemporary con context. So Chairman, it's, it's, it's my great pleasure and, uh, and it's a great pleasure to have you here today. And it uh, uh, brings back uh, fond memories of some times uh, that, I, that I had uh, many years ago on, on the Hopi Reservation. Chairman, you may be, uh, may be okay. muted. Can you hear me, Mr. Anderson? Oh, yes. Yes, good afternoon. Oh, okay. Perfect. Perfect. Thanks for that kind uh, introduction. And you did a great job with my last name as well. So thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, my name is Timothy Navangyama, and I do have the honor of serving as the chairman of the Hopi tribe. I do want to share a little bit of our unique challenges and um, some of the reality of what the Hopi tribe is dealing with, as well as maybe offering some solutions in regards to the funding that's avail available that we could certainly use some assistance on. Uh, the Hopi Reservation is located in the northeastern corner of Arizona and is approximately 2,500 square miles in size. The tribe is closing in on approximately 15,000 tribal members, over half of whom reside in one of the reservation's 12 villages. The tribe is on the front lines of the energy battle as the nation looks to shift to cleaner and greener energy sources. And as President Nez mentioned, we really didn't have a choice here. Uh, the tribe did not choose to be on the front lines, but that has been our lot based on our one valuable resource, which, which, is, which is coal. 
In the 1970s, the federal government built the Navajo Generating Station on the Navajo Reservation to provide electricity for Southern Arizona, while also providing the power to push water south through the Central Arizona project. NGS was unique in that uh, the federal government owned a 24% stake in the plant. The Navajo Generating Station was powered with coal from the tribe's Kayenta mining complex. When the federal government built the Navajo Generating Station, it was connected by rail to Kayenta mine, but made sure that the rail line did not extend beyond the NGS so that it could have a captive source of fuel that was beyond market forces or competition. In this way, Phoenix and its suburbs, massive growth and expansion were powered by cheap electricity and northern water, all provided thanks to Hopi Coal. In 2016, the operators of the Navajo Generating Station announced that they wanted to close NGS because natural gas was a far cheaper and cleaner way to fuel power plants. The news devastated the Hopi tribe because we relied on coal royalties to fund our essential government services. These royalties made up over 80% of our general fund. The tribe fought to try to save the NGS, but with little to no federal assistance. The Trump administration did make promises to the tribe in the case that NGS did close, including access to capacity on the transmission lines that ran to NGS, a portion of the water that was part of the NGS's allocation, and equal treatment with Navajo Nation on any assistance programming. The Navajo Generating Station eventually closed in 2019, devastating our tribe's economy. And despite the Trump administration's promises, the tribe did not receive transmission line capacity, a water allocation, or any economic assistance whatsoever. The tribe is now exploring all options to help save our economy. Two promising options are wind and solar power generation because two things that we have in abundance at Hopi are a lot of sun and a lot of wind. I'm very interested in learning more about the grant programs currently available at the Department of Energy and at other agencies to help construct these projects. However, funding is not the largest obstacle for clean energy development at Hopi. It is getting power generated off the Hopi reservation. The Hopi tribe is the only tribe and the only reservation that is completely landlocked by another tribe uh, in our reservation. The Hopi reservation is surrounded by the Navajo reservation. The Navajo Nation routinely demands a premium to acquire rights of ways for the tribe to access the outside world across the Navajo Reservation. This is the reason why the tribe was so focused on acquiring capacity on the power lines at the Navajo Generating Station. The Hopi tribe needs a route to get any power generated off the reservation. If the tribe can get the power off the reservation, then it needs customers that would be willing to purchase the energy. The federal government could assist by helping connect tribes like the Hopi tribe with utilities that would purchase our power. So we do have the capacity. We have lands off of our I-40 that feasibility studies were already done. Or lo site locations were uh, completed with the site selection already um, chosen. And so we are moving forward with that, but we still need you know, some uh, assistance in some of the technical portions of it. And again, uh, finding the market for the energy and that would help us create some revenue generation and replacement of some of the activities that happen at the Navajo generating station. Uh, our tribal was supportive in creating Hopi Utilities Corporation, which is currently conducting additional feasibility studies. Not only can we build um, a reliant power source for Hopi, but it's another avenue to build an economic component into this. So. There's multiple levels uh, that we're looking at as far as the funding goes and that technical assistance that uh, we also would be asking for from our federal partners in order to make this a reality for our Hopi tribe. So we have some challenges, but we know there are some solutions out there. And, uh, you know, we look forward to additional consultation and we're hoping that uh, Director Johns and the rest of our team will visit Hopi so we can you know, have this uh, further conversation as well and how we look at the future and our vision for our community members. But I also have to advocate for all the other communities that are impacted by this because I know we're not alone here. But uh, I do want to thank you all for giving us the opportunity to, you know, provide some comments here this afternoon. And uh, I look forward for towards uh, further discussion with uh, the director and the rest of the team. Thank you for the time. Well, 
Chairman, thank, thank you so much uh, for those comments. And, and I think it's really beneficial and, and uh, um, exactly what we're looking for when I, when I say that uh, uh, these uh, stakeholder engagement meetings and, and this meeting, one of the major purposes is uh, to inform our federal partners uh, about uh, uh, the communities, the community assets, and the situation. I think it was, uh, it was a, a very good overview. So, Chairman, thank, thank you so much. And, uh, and, and as we continue the uh, conversation, um, you know, we, we, in a little while, we'll move on to uh, some of those uh, funding opportunities uh, from EDA and, and others. But before I do that, uh, it's my, my pleasure to introduce uh, Congressman Tom O'Halloran. Uh, before retiring to Arizona and beginning a new life in public service, Congressman Tom O'Halloran served the Chicago Police Department as one of the youngest homicide detectives in the city's history. He later became a member of the Chicago Board of Trade and opened his own small business. Then upon retiring to Arizona, Congressman O'Halloran came out of retirement and ran for public office. He served in the Arizona House of Representatives and, and the state Senate. Then in 2016, he was elected to represent Arizona's first congressional district. In Congress, he serves on the House Committee on Energy and Commerce, uh, providing oversight for the Department of Energy, as well as the House Committee on Agriculture. So, Congressman Tom O'Halloran, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you, Brian. I appreciate it. Uh, it's good to see that the president is here and, and the chairman and two great uh, the Navajo Nation and, and the Hopi tribe. Uh, they're, they're great leaders. Uh, uh, hello, all of the rest of you. For those who don't know me, my name is Tom O'Halloran. I'm uh, represent Arizona's first congressional district in the House of Representatives. Uh, thank you for inviting me to join today to discuss available funding to support energy communities across Arizona and particularly for tribal communities. I've had the pleasure yesterday to spend 20 hours in committee uh, uh, working on the uh, uh, bills to address energy and, and some of the other elements uh, of the uh, Build Back America Better Act. And uh, those of you from the area are undoubtedly familiar uh, with the Navajo Generation Station. And NGS uh, was a powerhouse in northern Arizona. Many rural and tribal families relied on the good paying jobs it provided, and far too many were left without options when the plant closed. In 2019, I introduced the, the original version of my Promise Act, uh, legislation that would provide economic development resources to communities affected by the closure of the Navajo Generation Station and established job and skills training programs for displaced employees. This year, I reintroduced my bill uh, with key improvements uh, with the continued challenges of COVID-19 pandemic, tourism in the Page area has plummeted as it has in both of the nation and the tribe, uh, especially from international visitors. The community has also used to welcome, uh, used to welcoming. In introducing my uh, new Promise Act, I took into account the concerns of tribal leadership, county, local, and statewide stakeholders to provide an all of the above recovery approach for the community of Page so that many communities like it across rural America, where hardworking folks uh, are out of a job due to no fault of their own. And obviously, uh, for the, the community of Hopi and the Navajo Nation communities. Right now, Congress is considering new investments in energy infrastructure. I am uh, fighting to ensure that we target new economic relief at these communities where workers have worked for generations to keep the lights on for the country. We need to replace these lost jobs with new careers. And hopefully, uh, as we go into the future, faster than the outcome of so far what had occurred at the Navajo Generation Station. It was brought upon, uh, I think all of us, as a complete surprise. Um, yesterday when I uh, appeared before the committee, uh, I had asked them for an additional $1.38 billion. Uh, that would be over and above the $2 billion that's already in the bill, not as part of the, part of it is in consideration of the Promise Act, but other parts of it are uh, not in a way that I would like to see it addressed because uh, there's uh, too much control by outside sources and not those people that are directly impacted. 
Uh, no one bill is a cure-all, though. That's why this summer I was pleased to see the Economic Development Administration commit to uh, allotting $300 million of its $3 billion America Rescue Plan appropriation to support coal communities as they recover from the pandemic. And this funding will help communities create new jobs and opportunities, including through the creation or expansion of a new industry sector. Uh, this is critical. Uh, to the survival of uh, families, uh, the ability to meet the demands of the ever-increasing needs on uh, both uh, Navajo and Hopi, and to make sure uh, that we continue to create an environment with a better quality of life and, and for all the citizens of the tribal, co tribal country. Today, I'm looking forward to uh, taking your questions. Sadly, I, I'm in another middle of a 20 hour day on, on uh, hearings. And uh, yesterday I started at five in the morning, Arizona time. Today I got to sleep until six, and we, uh, we're probably going to go to about midnight or one or two in the morning today. Uh, but uh, it's the largest funding for coal communities in the history of the EDA and to discuss uh, other federal funding opportunities. Uh, I, I, I do want to say that uh, the the Energy and Commerce Committee is, is looking at a comprehensive package. Uh, energy is part of that. A significant part of what we're looking at right now is about $600 billion of the $3.5 trillion uh, available, hopefully, in the um, Build Back America Better Act. And with that, uh, I'm going to turn it back over and, uh, and listen. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them in the short time I have. Thank you. Great. Well, Congressman uh, O'Halloran, thank you so much. And, and President Nez and, and Chair, Chairman Nubanyoma, thank you so much uh, for your comments. I'm excited to hear uh, if, if there are any questions um, and uh, excited to also pass it back to uh, Briggs White, uh, who's the Deputy Executive Director uh, of the Interagency Working Group and a colleague at NATL as well as Kate Gordon, um, and uh, Kate is a senior advisor to Secretary Granholm uh, in the Department of Energy. So Briggs, I'll, I'll pass it back over to you and, and Kate. Well, and thank you for that. And thank you to our distinguished guests for that context. And uh, this great, the next panel is perfectly set up by the comments of our distinguished guests. Lots of discussion of EDA's uh, coal communities commitment and other federal funding opportunities. So I'm just gonna Stop talking and hand it over to Senior Advisor to Secretary Granholm, Kate Gordon, our wonderful colleague, to walk us through uh, this uh, moderated panel. So, Kate, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Briggs. And just wanted to do a special thank you to President Nez, Chairman uh, Nubayuma, and uh, Congressman O'Halloran, and of course, Brian Anderson, who's such a, a formidable leader of the NRHC work group. And um, Congressman, I, I wanted to give you a special shout out. You have been a champion for energy communities and for uh, and for all of us to really focus not just with words, but with real investment um, in the energy transition. And I just wanted to say, really appreciate your focus on communities and workers um, uh, in the work that you've done for this, this community. So we are moving into um, uh, our federal panel and the goal of this panel is really to identify existing and new programs and investments that are relevant to the work happening at the community level to think through what this transmission transition really looks like, how it can best uh, really um, can build economic prosperity and revitalization across communities. Um, we've designed, we've done, this is the fifth of five technical workshops we've done across the United States. Um, and we've done each of them very differently and they're really designed uh, to be responsive to folks in the community. And in this case, I wanted to say a special thank you to Nicole Horsherder, who is here and you'll hear from later, but who has been a really fantastic partner with us thinking through kind of key speakers, key issues um, and and ideas uh, going going forward. Um, this conversation is anchored in and starts with the Economic Development Administration, as you just heard from the congressman. Uh, the opportunity of new funding from EDA is is historic um, and the fact that there's a carve out not only for coal communities, but a separate carve out for indigenous communities is a, is a huge opportunity uh, for this 
uh, area for the Navajo and Hopi tribes, the tribal communities that also have energy connections across the US. Um, so that you will see a big focus from EDA. Um, I will turn to them in just a minute. Um, you will also see a big focus on the Department of Interior, who I know you all work with all the time. And um, many, many of the issues we're talking about are anchored in foundational issues around things like water um, and land. So that's uh, really there here for that perspective. You'll hear from NTIA, which is really here because of another foundational infrastructure issue, which is broadband. Um, Many of you are on the phone for this meeting because access is not what it should be. So we wanted to just provide, be very responsive to your needs and your recommendations here. And you'll hear from me on the Department of Energy at the end uh, there, but I, uh, we put me last because I think the others you're gonna hear from are really uh, in some ways more foundational to the work that we're doing. I will be doing question and answer after each of the agency's sections, um, actually, particularly after EDA and after Department of Interior, and then again after both NTIA and, and Energy um, speak. Uh, I will give you instruction on how to raise your hand at the beginning of each of those Q&A sections. I will give it over and over and over again. You'll get sick of me saying it, but we are trying very hard to be as inclusive as possible and as responsive as possible. So. I will give that instruction um, so, uh, at the beginning of each Q&A. I also wanted to say that we've had, uh, I'm thrilled at the participation here. Um, we have over 60 participants uh, in addition to panelists. We have heard from all of you the critical importance of, of, of being engaged and being um, able to ask questions and have a discussion. So uh, we've asked our speakers to be brief. Um, we are prioritizing question and answer. And I'll just ask each of you in your questions to be brief as well, to give others from your community a chance to ask questions. Um, we really want this to be as inclusive as possible. With that, I am going to turn things over for our first Economic Development Administration speaker, um, talking about this historic new opportunity and how you can actually access it. Um, these two who are about to speak will become your best friends and they should be uh, because they, um, they are, are really the key people to support you in applying for these funds. Um, I'm gonna start with Frank Francis uh, Sakaguchi, and then she will turn it to Cynthia Tack, who's the Arizona um, representative for EDA. Francis. Thank you, I wanna make sure that I'm connected and people can hear me. Am I good? We can hear you, yeah, we can see you. You can see me as well, wonderful. All right, thank you, Kate, and thank you to the Department of Energy. and. For the Hanover Agency Working Group as well, to providing us uh, for doing all the work that they're doing and organizing this and providing EDA the opportunity to be a participant. Um, I always also want to say that it's a pleasure um, to uh, speak to President Nez and Chairman Devangioma and their communities, um, as well as the, the support of Congress Congressman um, O'Halloran and, and his service and the work that he does. So let's go ahead and and start here. Um, we only have a few minutes, so what I'm going to focus on, or what Cindy and I are going to focus on pretty much here is talking about the the American Rescue Plan Act and the funding that came along with that, because that is um, a substantial amount of dollars that EDA has not had before. Um, for those of you um, who are more, you're probably familiar with EDA, uh, but just to go over this really quickly, um, that we are a really small agency within the Department of Commerce, and um, there are multiple agencies that do economic development work, but that is the main focus for EDA, is to do economic development and, and to lead uh, the federal economic development agenda by promoting, promoting innovation and competitiveness. Um, we uh, support uh, community-led economic development, and uh, we help communities develop their um, their economic capacity, uh, their resilience, and uh, um, and and their local um, businesses, and and hopefully create a lot of a lot of local jobs as well. Uh, if we go on to the next slide, please. Uh, with this American Rescue Plan, EDA has received, oh gosh, probably six times or more uh, the amount of funding that we normally receive in in, in a, a year. We received three billion dollars. And, and that's to invest in American communities. Um, it supports uh, bottom up economic development and uh, we advance um, equity, uh, creating good paying jobs, doing helping 
was workforce development, um, helping workers to develop their skills. Um, these are all the various opportunities to diversify the economy um, and um, you know, accelerating the economic recovery um, in, in various areas, particularly in this case, uh, here was the was the co closures. Now there's a lot of opportunity with our funding here. The one thing that I will say is this is an opportunity for us to learn as well about your needs and what is going on there uh, in the in the energy sector wise, and then hopefully being able to to utilize some of these fundings that we have this this unprecedented amount of funding to be able to to stir up the the economy and provide some solutions um, uh, as we can do things such as. Uh, Planning strategies, uh, studies, uh, creating tools, technical assistance, um, as well as some implementation work um, with some of the basic things, uh, including infrastructure, from waste uh, uh, wastewater to water to um, to broadband as well. That's not our, our focus, but EDA is very very flexible in what they can do. Kind of go on to the next slide, please. So our American Rescue Plan funding um, will invest in jobs for today, community. Um, built for all and regions for the future. And we have six different funding buckets to help us do that. Kind of divided the funding buckets out based off of, off of these categories, but they're really quite flexible. Um, if we go on to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit more about the, the different funding buckets. So there we go. It's kind of tiny, but hopefully you all can see that and we'll have a copy of this so we can, we can set out. There are six um, specific funding buckets and they each have a separate uh, notice of funding opportunities. Basically, uh, grants.gov is where you can find these, but they will talk about the requirements of this funding. Um, in particular, and oh, here next, the second column over is the amount nationwide in terms of how much funding has been set aside for these buckets, as well as the description. I think in particular, um, you'll see number three, four, and five. Um, that is the economic adjustment assistance. Uh, and then we have indigenous communities and then we have built back better. Those three, I think right now, in terms of the focus with your energy, you, is, is going to probably be the buckets that you're looking at. Although all these funds are, the tribe is eligible to utilize all these funds with the exception of those um, that are focused toward the state. The um, on the economic adjustment and on the build back better, we do have a coal communities uh, commitment, and there we have set aside funding uh, for those um, specifically. Um, specific they're within the other funding buckets, but they are specific to coal communities. Now, um, if you go to the next slide. Um, I'm going to have uh, Cindy Patak, who is your economic development rep. She is in Arizona. She's on the ground there. I am up here in Washington State, beautiful Washington State, and I wish I could be there. But Cindy uh, will go over some of these these buckets here and get into a little bit more detail. I know we're we don't have much time, but um, she will be your she really is be your best friend, and she's there on the ground. And and I know she loves working with the tribe. So, Cindy, do you want to? If, can you hear me? Can you take this on? Pass yes, to you. absolutely. Yes. Uh, thank you, Francis. Yes, and as, as Francis mentioned, we are both out of the Seattle Regional Office, but uh, it's been almost a year now that I've actually moved to the state of Arizona. So while we're both working remotely, I am your boots on the ground here, very accessible. Um, so I hope that we can continue the conversation after this presentation. Um, eligible entities for EDA's programs encompass a range of governments organizations and public institutions. Economic development districts like the Northern Era Council of Governments or NACOG as you probably know them, tribal nations, state and local governments, colleges and universities, and nonprofits that serve our communities. I think the one caveat that I'd like to point out is that we do not provide funding for ind individuals or private entities. Next slide, please. At the beginning of the year, the Biden administration issued a new set of uh, priorities for EDA investments, and you see them here up on the screen. There are seven of them. I'm not going to dig into those too deeply today, but to the right of the screen, you'll see a link there in which we do have robust discussions on each one of those priorities, <clears throat> but they are as follows. Equity, recovery and resilience, workforce development, manufacturing, technology-based 
economic development, environmentally sustainable development, exports, and foreign direct investments. At the top of the list, you'll notice that we put a spotlight on equity. And you know, throughout our history, we really sought to bring our resources to bear on the, re on the issues facing distressed communities across the country. So with regard to every single funding opportunity that, that Francis showed us up on the screen, we were really, we're specifically asking applicants to highlight how any proposed projects will bring EDA investments to those communities and people who have been underserved in the past. Next slide, please. You know, and now let's dig in a little bit into the coal communities commitment. $200 million for coal communities projects will come from the, Ameri uh, the economic adjustment assistance and $100 million has been set aside under our Build Back Better Regional Challenge. Our coal communities funding is not just for coal mining dependent regions, but it also encompasses communities with coal-fired power plants and areas of the country where mining equipment is manufactured or where there are other supply chain, logistics, or transportation partners. Coal communities are also eligible to apply under the other notices in addition to the funding that is specific to this industrial cluster. And we can fund things such as planning, technical assistance, infrastructure constructions, and project that, projects that can support the creation of new jobs and the exploration of new opportunities. Next slide. Moving on to the Indigenous Communities Funding Opportunity, this, uh, this funding opportunity is intended to provide economic adjustment assistance to tribes or public-private nonprofit organizations that serve Native communities. Nationwide, we've set aside $100 million for funding activities under this program. And similar to the Travel, Tourism, and Outdoor Recreation NOFO, uh, we recommend uh, submission of all applications by January 31st, 2022, although it is a rolling application deadline, so you can submit an application uh, whenever you're ready. Eligible projects can be basic community infrastructure such as water, sewer, energy, or vocational and higher education facilities. And the Seattle Regional Office, out of this $100 million, we set aside $43.8 million. And we're in, uh, for Indian tribes, there is no matching fund requirements, uh, which means that a tribe is eligible for 100% of their project and, and does not have to contribute matching funds. Next slide. The Economic Adjustment Assistance is EDA's most flexible program. Uh, applications will be accepted through March 31st for construction and non-construction projects. And out of the 500 million set aside, the Seattle Regional Office has received $60 million approximately. Um, and like some of the other NOFOs, while there is a 20% matching requirement, again, tribes under this NOFO and all of them are eligible for 100% of federal assistance. The funds can be used for infrastructure development, economic development planning, feasibility studies, incubator and accelerator innovation projects. And you know, for anyone who has worked with EDA in the past, you'll recognize this as part of our more traditional portfolio of projects, and so you should be familiar with these. Uh, generally, this program does require commitments from private sector partners to create good paying jobs and leverage their investments in, in plants and equipment. Next slide. Now, now, we do have a few regional challenge, challenges, and this is one of them, and by far, this is some of our most transformational approaches to economic recovery. The Build Back Better Challenge is the largest investment that we're making, and you can see that up on the screen with a billion dollars projected to be spent in support of regional cluster growth. The intention is to transform economically distressed communities through substantial investment in a collection of complementary aligned construction and non-construction projects that are organized around a singular vision for regional cluster development. And that could be growing new industries or it could be scaling existing ones. The program is laid out in a two-part process and that infographic there up on the screen hopefully uh, helps you visualize that. Um, a two-part process in which in the first, first phase, we accept concept proposals that outline a regional collection of projects that facilitate the development or the expansion of an industry cluster or clusters. Competitive applications will need to provide information on regional assets, industry leadership, sustainability, and equity. And to the right of the screen, you'll see how we have broken down that phase one and phase two deadlines. The first one for technical assistance is fast approaching. It's on October 19th. Um, and that's available at 100% federal share as well. 
and phase two, the deadline for that is March 15, 2022. And I think it's also important to know that you, you can't really dip in into phase two, but in order to move on to phase two, you must apply to phase one. And you could see, as you see kind of that funnel, the way it kind of dips down, we're looking at about 50 to 60 regions awarded under phase two, and that will competitively kind of winnow its way down to what we could anticipate to be about 20 to 30 regions. But I also think it's important to note that if you don't make it to phase two, that what you do have at the end of phase one is a really solid portfolio of projects that could also be eligible under some of our other funding opportunities and it could also be used to seek funding opportunities from other federal agencies as well, and even in uh, fund philanthropical institutions. Next slide, please. Now, the American Rescue Plan required that we set aside 25% of our available funding to go toward the support of the recovery of the travel, tourism, and outdoor recreation industries. We anticipate awarding uh, $750 million in both competitive and non-competitive grants. Now, the non-competitive piece, $510 million was set aside, and that has, is going directly to states and American territories to support state-level recovery efforts. The state can spend the awards themselves or competitively sub-award the funds. Uh, an invitation has gone out to Governor Ducey and they're working on a statement of work right now. What I'd really like to focus on here today for our purposes is the remaining $240 million under the tourism NOFO that will be competitively, uh, competitive, competitively awarded for construction and non-construction to support a community's recovery efforts. This part of the program has a 20% matching requirement with EDA providing 80% of a project's cost. Although, once again, I want to reiterate uh, that Indian tribes are eligible for 100% of the federal share and that eligible activities include strategy development, construction projects like cultural projects, arts, visitor facilities, uh, new recreational infrastructure, and public access enhancements. Deadlines for applications is suggested to be around January 31st, 2022. And again, that's to help us meet our statutory requirement to get that all of our funding out by September of 2022. Out of this uh, 240 that we have left over for competitive grants, uh, the Seattle Regional Office's initial allocation of $57.7 million for this competitive program. Moving on to the next slide, I want to talk about our other national challenge. Uh, the Good Jobs Challenge seeks to support getting Americans back to work by establishing or strengthening regional workforce training systems through industry sector partnerships. Uh, 500 million has been set aside under this funding opportunity with an emphasis on job placements and quality jobs. And uh, what we mean by that, the way EDA is really defining quality jobs is, a, is really a job that exceeds the local prevailing wage for an industry in the region and includes basic benefits such as paid leave, health insurance, retirement or savings plan, and or is unionized and really helps employees develop skills and experiences necessary to advance along a career path. So even though some of those positions could be considered entry level, for example, but that there is a clear path uh, toward moving up uh, like we all like to. So that is really it in a nutshell. I think the other important thing I'd like to point out, you know, just based on some of the questions that I've been receiving from potential applicants, is there seems to be some concern and a lot of discussion on, you know, which NOFO is for me. Um, and what I'd like to say is that there's really no wrong answer here. I would suggest that in reading through these, uh, you'll see that they're, they're specific. Six of them, we have six of them for a reason. We're looking to address uh, a, a couple of different things. So as you read through them, you know, to the extent that you see a good fit, go for that one. But know that we do have discretion uh, when we're reviewing your grant application and we can kind of move them around, whether, you know, some of them are oversubscribed and we want to move you into another one um, or that we feel it's a better fit. And we can work closely with you on that. And again, you know, that's what I'm here for. And so I'm going to turn it back now to my colleague, Francis, just so that we, uh, we can wrap up this portion of the show. Thank you. Fine. Hopefully you can all hear me again. Right. And yes, you can hear me. Okay, good. Um, and so thank you, Cindy, for that. And this is a lot of information. Um, again, this is more funding than EDA has, has received. We have a short amount of time to get it out. 
and there are different ways to utilize these funds. Um, this page is just a summary of the funding that Cindy had, had uh, covered uh, with some of the deadlines, some of the descriptions, and um, hopefully you'll be able to, able to get a copy of this, but it is, again, an off, each funding has a lot of information, um, especially in the funding announcement, so it's not very easy to go through, but we're here to help you out on that. Just the last slide, please. Here is both Cindy's contact information as well as my information. Um, again, Cindy is your economic development rep there in Arizona. I'm the regional integrator. And my role, I come in more in terms of being able to work with a lot of the other agency partners here, um, including those that are that are on this presentation. We know that um, probably, probably one agency's funding alone or one, one agency's ability cannot resolve um, all the different needs that are out there. And a lot of times it's that collaborative effort and we are more than willing and wanting to work in this collaborative effort, which is part of this IWG group here. Also, a list of resources here, uh, this www.eda.gov slash ARPA, tremendous amount of resources there. Uh, we had some recorded webinars. There's also some technical assistance type of webinars and presentations. Um, and the links are also there to the funding announcements. So be sure to, to check those out. And again, if you have any questions whatsoever or just discussions on, on these types of programs um, after today, um, please, please feel feel free to reach out to Cindy uh, or myself. And that was that. Kate, I think I'm gonna turn it back to you. Thank you so much. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Um, sorry, my video is not working either. Thank you so much. Um, Francis and I just sent you and Cindy a quick note. If you could put your uh, uh, contact information in the chat, that would be great. So, because people won't have had the slide up for very long, and I think you will, as I said, I think be everybody's um, best friend uh, during this process. We have a little bit of time for questions um, for uh, for Francis and for for Cindy. Let me just um, remind you again to ask a question if you're on the uh, computer. Please, if you're seeing us in person, uh, please use the smiley icon at the bottom of your screen to raise your hand to be unmuted. And if you're on um, the phone, then please do star three to raise your hand to be unmuted. Um, I'm gonna just start really quick with um, a question that came in through the chat, which is um, just a question about whether, and if, if Cindy and Francis, if you could put yourselves back on camera, that'd be great um, during the Q and A. Um, uh, question if we could have the uh, Seattle office specific amounts again, can, can you tell us again um, exactly how much is available for this region and the states in the region as well? Uh, sure, Francis, I'm happy to take that. Um, sure. I, I think it should be noted that the national challenges that we mentioned, those are programs and those are challenges that are coming out of headquarters. So the Seattle regional office does not have an allocation for uh, Build Back Better, the Good Jobs Challenge, and statewide planning and research. So those are three that, again, those that's a national competition. The three for which the Seattle Regional Office has received allocations are the Tribal, the Indigenous Tourism, NOFO. We have about $43.8 million for that. The Tourism, NOFO, for the competitive piece, we have about $57.7 million. And under economic adjustment and assistance, we have about 59.4 million. And I will enter that in the chat as well, if you'd like. Great, thank you so much. Um, I, I, another question that has come uh, through is, um, uh, well, it's sort of a broad question and, and I know you sort of answered this, but I think that can never be answered too many times, which is uh, just an eligibility question. So there's all these different pockets of money in the EDA proposal. I think people are still a little confused about, you know, do they have to apply six times to each of those? Is it one application and you'll decide where it best fits? Like, how is that? How does that work? Um, who's eligible and how, sort of how does it work as, as folks in this community who probably overlap many of those categories are starting to think about proposals? Okay, Francis, I'll start, but you chime in where appropriate. Um, and again, I, what I like to say here too, and Francis mentioned this, this is, the, this is transformational for EDA. And so as much, you're learning from us, but we are learning a lot from you too. And we ourselves have a lot to learn 
because there's just so much information there for us too. So the direction that we've been given is that you, what you really don't want to do is take one project and submit it six times, for example. Um, submit it once and really focus on putting together the most robust and competitive application that you possibly can. And so really focus and strategize in that regard. And I can certainly help you do that. Again, that's what I'm here for. And luckily, Francis is my lifeline too. So if I have to call for additional expertise, I'm more than happy to do that. Um, and Francis, this is made where I may need your help too. Let's talk about the Build Back Better Challenge because it's my understanding. And you know, say for example, you're part of a coalition that's submitting for a portfolio of projects under the Build Back Better Challenge. What we want you to do is stick with that path. And so if, you know, while it is a coalition, you'll have to identify, you know, a certain number of projects to, to lift up that regional cluster. What we don't want you to do is pull away your individual project that's part of your coalition and submit it separately uh, to another NOFO. That said, if in fact um, your, regional, your regional proposal does not make it on to phase two, we could suggest, and I think that, and this is Francis, where I need your help, like the headquarters team may take these individual projects and, and, and shop them around as well and direct them to uh, individual funding opportunities on, the, on behalf of the applicant. And that said, you would also be able to do that yourself too. Yeah, and I think that's going to have to, to uh, be involved with some um, or has something to do with what the, the funding availability um, as well as as um, you know, where you are um, in the uh, phase one, uh, whether or not you move on or, or don't move on with, with phase one. I mean, certainly if, if you move on with phase one, then you are eligible to go on in phase two. And this may all sound like nonsense at this point because um, it, even for us as staff, it took us a while to, to be able to, to distinguish the different types of funding requirements and, and what it all, um, what it all entails. Um, I would say the best thing really is to work with Cindy um, and to work uh, with myself if, if needed. And, and we can help guide that, you know, we'll get an understanding of what your needs are and uh, what your, um, what your project is, what the larger picture is, what the story is behind it, and as well as what you're trying to do uh, goal-wise as well. And that can help us help you uh, steer which which pot would probably be the best pot uh, and the most competitive uh, in terms of which funding funding pot to go for. Perfect, thank you. And uh, I think you're hearing again uh, how important Cindy is to you if you are doing these applications. She has just put her phone number as well in the chat and I'm gonna read it out as well because there are some folks on the phone. It is 206-888-3386, 206-888. 3386. So um, uh, that is really helpful. Thanks for putting that chat. I know we, we are going to move on. There will be an opportunity for more questions after the federal panel, but I did want to ask one last question because it's relevant to what you just said, Francis, which is, can you just um, clarify again, just phase one versus phase two? And specifically, someone's asking, can phase one be used for scoping assessment and feasibility, what's the range of things that are in that planning bucket in phase one? And what's the relationship between phase one and phase two? Can you get a phase two grant if you didn't get a phase one grant or are they tied together? You want to answer that, Cindy? You cannot get a phase two if you don't get a phase one. Um, but the phase one is where you identify your lead. Um, you can do your planning there. Uh, you can, uh, you don't have to have all the details yet, um, but you are basically identifying uh, the lead partner, what your scope is, what what you're pro what you're trying to go for. Um, you can do environmental, you can do some um, preliminary engineering, um, but it's more on the planning side. You you only have five hundred thousand dollars there. It can um, time frame wise. Uh, Cindy mentioned there is an October nineteenth deadline to get the phase one in. However, the work can continue on. Um, I think we're looking at one to two years. Uh, the work can continue on if you are awarded phase one. And you can still, if you get awarded phase one, even though you haven't completed the work, you can still put in for phase two during that time frame. Cindy, you can have, you can add more details to that. 
Yeah, and, and I think what I would just say about the Build Back Better Challenge is that is a commitment, and the commitment starts with phase one, and it works its way through phase two. And, you know, the, really the advice I give everyone is to, you know, try not to hedge your bets, although that's kind of the, the human reaction is to, you know, more is better. Um, but, you know, and again, working together, I, I can help you brainstorm and help you kind of strategically discern you know, what is the better pot? But I think it's important to note with that Build Back Better Challenge, you're part of a greater whole here. And then it's an, a really important to define what that greater whole is. And that's defined by both your coalition, but it's also uh, depends, and it also is you're wrapping yourself around a regional economic cluster. And so all of that stuff, you kind of have to have already, to my way of thinking, you have to have some sense of what that is now. Uh, and then in order to put that application together, um, we're asking that everyone that's part of the coalition sign something that says, you know, that not only are we aware, but we're also committed to seeing this through kind of it's a it's a cradle to grave commitment and it can extend over a period of time. Um, but that's what we're looking for there. Thanks so much, Cindy. Um, and I'll just say that, uh, you know, the other thing is don't forget about the economic adjustment assistance grants as well. It's a larger pot of money. Um, it's it's more uh, probably appropriate for sort of already planned and thought through projects that need to be implemented. And as both Chairman uh, Nubansuma has said, and also President Nez, um, there are many things that you that you have already thought through as communities. There you've already done scoping and feasibility on a number of of potential projects. So I would just say don't forget about the other side. I think Build Back Better gets a lot of attention justifiably. It's very exciting. Um, to think about regional economic development in this way, but the EAA uh, funding is also incredibly flexible and um, really yes. worth looking at as well. You know, yeah. and to that point too, so is the indigenous communities NOFO. And I would look at the eligibility criteria and the special criteria there, because they're somewhat relaxed and also acknowledges that we understand the expense that it takes sometimes to put together in applications and the unfair burden that that really is on an Indian tribe. And so under that funding opportunity, we do um, cover some pre-award costs, such as those engineering reports uh, and some of those other things that really are required as part of the application process, but are also costly. So, you know, it's, it's important to kind of take a look at that one, too, but not, doesn't, it isn't exclusive in that regard. Perfect. And I think this is really important as well. I mean, we may have the funding right now. Um, because of the ARPA funds, which is really great and, and again, it is transformational, but at the same time. We're not the experts on what the needs are out there um, in these tribal communities and, and you know, they know their needs the best in their projects. So this is an opportunity for us to learn as well so that we can help assist to be able to, to get this, um, hopefully some of these things funded. Perfect, that was actually a great segue um, because all of these ideas and projects and uh, and visions are going to have elements that are um, uh, really touch on the expertise of other federal agencies besides EDA and also uh, community and state uh, and tribal agencies. Um, and one of those, uh, and a really important one, is um, the U.S. Department of Interior. And so thank you, Francis and Cindy. I'm going to transition. Um, thank you. Thank you. To our, our DOI friends, um, of which we have many on the call uh, because uh, because land and water are uh, are such important elements of kind of all of the uh, plans and visions and ideas from um, this community. So I'm gonna go to, I think I'm starting with um, BLM, with Bureau of Land Management. I will ask my Department of Interior colleagues to pass it on to each other if you don't mind. When you're done, just go to your next, your next colleague. Um, we will have Q&A after this section as well. So save up your questions. Turning it over to Susan Lee. Thank you. Good afternoon. I was asked to speak uh, to the group today about the Bureau of Land Management's Abandoned Mine Land Program. My name is Susan Lee, and I'm the deputy for the Division of Aquatics, Air, and Environmental Protection, of which Abandoned Mine Land Program is um, in the Environmental Protection Group. Uh, next slide, slide, please. The um, I'm tasking with three screens in front of me. Thank you. The abandoned mine land program focuses on reclamation of former hard rock or non coal abandoned mines on BLM administered lands. Those uh, properties are defined as 
uh, sites that have, were abandoned prior to January 1st, 1981, when there were changes to the mining law that uh, recaptured uh, funds for reclamation of those sites. So these are um, pre-January 1st, 1981 mining sites that have no claimant of record and no viably, uh, viable, potentially responsible party. The program seeks to improve uh, physical safety aspects and environmental degradation of sites used for mining prior to those dates on both BLM administered or affected lands. The program, in addition to addressing the numerous uh, administration priorities through executive order and other directives and budget, um, primarily prioritizes these sites on a state by state basis based on the risk at risk at the site for both physical and environmental degradation and typically approaches it on a watershed basis. The goal, of course, is to um, prevent uh, physical and environmental harm to the land and people, and also to return those uh, lands to productive uses. Um, this slide shows a uh, definition of hard rock um, mines, but again, it's mostly non-coal. Uh, next slide, please. The fiscal year 2021 budget, the current fiscal year budget as approved um, is currently at $38.5 million. And these funds include hazmat cleanup also. So in addition to abandoned mine land properties, things like um, unintended spills on BLM administered lands or um, other environmental issues. Um, in, in the far west, we have a lot of marijuana growth sites, for example. Um, this fund also covers those activities. However, in uh, the predominant amount of the funds does go to abandoned mine land projects and for Arizona, New Mexico and Utah, it's uh, roughly about um, six or $7 million rather. Um, we do receive additional funding for cleanup of these lands from um, what's called the Central Hazmat Fund, which is uh, a program through the department that we compete projects um, with and um, on a limited uh, so funding source, there's about uh, 10 to $20 million a year in, in that um, program for us to compete against other uh, interior bureau uh, projects. We also do participate with the Department of Energy's defense related uranium mine program and receive funds to inventory and identify uh, uranium mines that were used um, for defense related purposes. And I believe the tribes have also um, engaged in that program as well and should be familiar with it. Uh, in fiscal year 22, we will be having each BLM state office develop what we are calling a state environmental cleanup action plan to identify abandoned mine lands as well as other environmental hazards um, on BLM administered lands or those um, affecting BLM lands. And uh, those, those plans will hopefully provide an opportunity also to have more engagement at the program level. Um, we always have we always have engagement at the project level. And so this is an effort to have a better list. So we have a better inventory of our needs and then also to uh, provide more opportunity for engagement. Um, just a few notes about the budget. Uh, most of these funds are awarded through contract or through grants. And uh, so there's opportunities there for um, tapping into these resources. And I think probably one of the reasons we were invited to chat here is that there are several proposals currently making their way uh, through Congress and under consideration that would substantially increase AML funding, uh, both to our program, the BLM, and also at the department level um, and other, other bureaus in the department. And that would include uh, funding, currently proposes to include funding for states and tribes. So hopefully if those pass, uh, we'll have an opportunity to present on those programs as they become available. Um, and with the next slide, I'm gonna turn it over to Jerry in the Arizona State Office to talk about how, how to engage with uh, the Band of Mine Land Program. Jerry? Thanks, Susan. Um, so uh, both on energy development, uh, Band of Mine Lands, coal, um, Kind of everything I'm going to say after this is, is generally applicable to all of those things. 
uh, some more than others though. So uh, unlike some of the other agencies participating in the federal panel, the BLM does not currently have resources or funding opportunities available to facilitate energy development. Uh, however, the BLM uh, is standing by ready and willing to have conversations around how we can support these efforts and be a good neighbor in the management of both tribal and, and public lands. Um, we see it as mutually beneficial for, for tribes and for the BLM and the department to be aware of what are being planned for transmission and different things like that. So we can look at uh, siting and, and facilitating those projects as best possible. Um, and that also includes, you know, where necessary, we're ready and willing to prioritize the cadastral surveying that may be needed to support energy development projects uh, within the, the funding that's available for those types of things. Um, we also remain committed to the consultation project process for energy and transmission projects and other federal undertakings uh, to ensure that uh, traditional properties, cultural resources, and landscapes are protected. And uh, when public lands may be involved in an energy or transmission project, I would just encourage you to reach out to the local BLM field manager early in the project development phase. Um, and that goes for, for anything that's related to energy as well as the AML. Uh, or coal or uh, any anything, any other type of project that might, um, you know, cross public lands adjacent to reservations or, or whatever, or adjacent to tribal fee land for that matter. Um, and to engage with those managers, you know, to identify what the appropriate process are for those projects uh, to ensure that things are kind of laid out from the beginning and everybody knows what, what to expect and uh, timelines, all of that kind of thing. You know, and then if, if you're ever unsure of, you know, the appropriate uh, contact for a project or how BLM might be able to engage or support uh, your project, you know, please reach out to the appropriate DM, uh, BLM deputy state directors that are identified on the slide that are currently up now. And uh, since you won't be seeing that too long, we'll drop that into the chat uh, after this. Um, and that's Pretty much all we've got. We'll stand by for Q and A, and I'll turn it over to Matt Magruder with the Office of Surface Mining and Reclamation and Enforcement. Thank you, Susan and Jerry. Let me get my presentation up here. All right. So uh, I'm glad to have the opportunity to uh, share information about uh, our program and uh, just wanted to echo the sentiment of everyone uh, on the opportunities for the Navajo Nation and Hopi tribe. So my name is Matthew Magruder with the Office of Surface Mining Reclamation and Enforcement, or OSMRE, uh, and I will be covering our Abandoned Mineland Economic Revitalization, or AMLER program. Um, this program was previously referred to as the AML pilot, so if you come across that reference, that is the same program as AML. So the goal of the AMLER program is to support economic and community development in areas impacted by historical coal, coal abandoned mine land. Uh, one advantage of the AMLER program compared to our other programs is that funds can be used to fund economic and community development in addition to reclamation. Um, and it's not required, but it's certainly encouraged to leverage public and private funding sources to increase the uh, scope uh, and impact of projects. But Regardless of the funding source, the purpose of the AMLER program is to create uh, measurable improvements for historic coal communities. Um, so this can be accomplished with projects directly constructing an econ economic and community benefit or creating favorable conditions for development in the future. Uh, and the AMLER program has been funded annually by Congress since 2016 uh, with funding available for tribes with abandoned mine land programs since 2018. Uh, which includes both Navajo Nation and Hobie Tribe. So taking a look at this diagram to uh, show the amount of AMLER funding provided to states and tribes, um, the appropriation law that funded the AMLER program each year is referenced uh, here at the bottom, and that dictates the amount of funding that each state uh, or tribe will receive that year. Um, so amounts have been consistent uh, for AML tribes, uh, and they've received 3.33 million each year since 2018 uh, for a total of 13.3 million each. Uh, AMLER funds from each fiscal year uh, can be used for more than one project, uh, but due to um, reporting requirements for the grants, funds from separate 
from separate fiscal years uh, uh, are not combined for the same uh, project without distinct phases of metrics. So for projects that require more than 3.33 million, it may be easier to use AMLER funds in addition to leverage funds from other sources. So to be eligible for AMLER funds, there's a few criteria to consider. Um, the first is if you're an, uh, an eligible state or tribe, uh, which you can see on the map here. Um, and again, which is Navajo Nation and Hopi tribe. Uh, the next is to is that the project needs to have a nexus to a coal AML site, which could be if it's on or adjacent uh, to that site, and that could be a site that is unreclaimed or previously reclaimed. Um, or it could also be a nexus to coal AML uh, or an area that's impacted by coal AML, uh, for example, an area that has lost jobs. Um, so the, the project must also have a nexus to economic and or community development uh, and have a measurable outcome. Um, and as I mentioned before, the projects can, pr uh, can produce the benefit directly or create conditions to promote future development. Uh, so, for example, infrastructure improvements or site preparation. Um, so, OSMRE uh, has developed an annual guidance document um, that has more details on project eligibility, and that can be found on our website, uh, and it's also linked here. So, the types of benefits that an AMLER project can create will depend on the type of project. Uh, but there is no criteria that every AMLER project has to have the same type of benefit. Uh, we've seen a variety of examples, including jobs and businesses created, communities, households, students uh, that have been served or their experiences improved, uh, number of visitors brought into an area um, for an attraction um, and uh, just improving the local economy, um, or infrastructure created, uh, enhanced, improved, restored, uh, Anything along those lines, so uh, which and how many of these metrics a project may may fulfill will vary depending on the specific project, but uh, OSMRE develops an annual report uh, and which summarizes the status of all the AMLER projects and that has a lot more details on the project benefits. So uh, that's another useful tool uh, to get a sense of the, the types of projects um, that are in the program. Uh, and then that's also available on our website and linked here. So we recognize how quickly a project uh, or how quickly a project will be completed and achieve its benefits will also vary um, depending on its unique situation. Uh, but based on AMLER projects thus far, we, we see many being completed within a few years. Uh, so as a summary of that progress, uh, we have some numbers here for AMLER projects across all states and tribes. But uh, once a project is selected by the state or tribe, it's submitted to OSMRE for preliminary approval. Uh, and that just is to ensure that everything, the project has everything that needs to be eligible for AMLER funds. Uh, and then the next step is for the project to receive an authorization to proceed from OSMRE, and that's the go ahead to break ground. Uh, so once a project is completed, and it will be generating benefits uh, that it originally proposed. So with the great variety of projects, uh, there's a, a very broad variety of, of examples, uh, but just to uh, look at some of the categories, we, we see projects that are uh, developing industrial parks, uh, food production, a range of different outdoor recreation activities, um, training centers, different types of infrastructure, uh, including uh, renewable electricity generation. Uh, so looking specifically at uh, AMLER projects for the Navajo Nation, uh, there are currently two with preliminary approval, uh, which are using funds from fiscal year 18 and 19. Uh, and one of these projects, the Kanta Industrial Park, uh, has authorization to proceed and is expected to be completed in 2023. Um, currently, the Hopi tribe has no project submitted for preliminary approval, so all of their funding is still available. So taking a quick look at an example project, the uh, Kenton Industrial Park. Um, that this, this project is expanding infrastructure um, at this industrial park, uh, which includes a new water line, new sewer line, new roads, uh, winding connecting roads, uh, and all of these things are working toward attracting new businesses uh, that have expressed interest uh, to uh, operating in the park with that new infrastructure. And the goal here is to create jobs uh, in this community 
uh, which has very high unemployment rates. So uh, some tips and contact information. Um, in order to discuss the site specific questions and to submit applications, you can reach out to our uh, counterparts in the Navajo and Hopi AML programs uh, and have uh, their contact information uh, listed here uh, in the presentation, which uh, you'll be getting a copy of afterwards. And I can also add that to the chat as well. Um, but, uh, but yeah, they are uh, going to be the best resource for anything specific to uh, anything on the ground and for uh, project application submission. Uh, so to also note here uh, that the, uh, again, the Ambler funds do not require other leverage funds um, and can serve as leverage funds with other leverage funds. And the guidance document and annual report are uh, other resources to check out. So to wrap up, uh, if you have any questions on the Amler program at large, you can reach out to OSM Marie and uh, you can contact Elan Norman Moore, uh, who is the chief of our reclamation support division, uh, and Sterling Reinout, who's the assistant director of the uh, program support directorate. So with that, I will pass it on to John and Carla with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Thank you. Johanna, do we have you? Yes, I'm just trying to turn my camera on. No worries. Um, we can hear you great. Okay, thank you. Um, President Nez, Chairman Navayangama, I sincerely appreciate the opportunity to be on this panel today with the great work that is being done for tribes out there in Indian country facing the challenges that you all are facing and uh, the opportunity to bring these 11 federal partners together to share and the future successes as we coordinate together to achieve the goals and the objectives that you all are wanting to uh, work through for your communities. First and foremost, I want to um, introduce Carla. Clark. She is the director for the Indian Energy Service Center. Her role and responsibility is to expedite energy and mineral renewable activities on Indian lands and to strive and standardize those processes by removing barriers and providing multi-agency discipline for the various federal partners that are housed at the Indian Energy Service Center in Lakewood, Colorado. This effort is to maximize our efficiencies in the management and partnerships with tribes. And I'm thankful that we also have the Division of Minerals and Energy Development. They've uh, transitioned over into the Office of Trust Services. They have been providing technical support and assistance to both the Navajo Nation and the Hopi tribe to help mitigate the effects of reduced revenues from the reduced coal production on each nation's land. This effort is to find ways to produce clean energy, affordable, reliable power and resources that will sustain you in that effort uh, through grants and other opportunities that they've been working with you and your staff and your um, tribal programs. And with that, I will turn it over to Carla so she can introduce what we do with the Indian Energy Service Center, and I look forward to the questions and answers that we may be able to provide and uh, support you all with your renewable projects and anything else that uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs could stand ready to help you with. Carla? Hi, good afternoon. Can you all hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, good afternoon, distinguished uh, guests and presenters, including uh, President Nez and Chairman Yvonne Giyama. Thank you for the opportunity to speak before you today. Uh, like Jana said, my name is Carla Clark. Um, I'm the acting uh, director of the Indian Energy Service Center. Um, so we just wanted to uh, 
present our office. Uh, it's a newer office through the Department of Interior. Um, and then just have answer any questions that you may have um, and see if we can uh, be able to uh, assist you in any type of projects or requests that come in. So the Indian Energy Service Center is a Department of Interior multi-agency collaboration between uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the Bureau of Land Management, um, the Office of Natural Resources Revenue, and the Bureau of Trust Funds Administration. And these are the four agencies that are housed within the Indian Energy Service Center. Uh, as John has stated, our mission is to expedite Indian oil and gas activities, uh, standardize processes, remove barriers, and provide for a multidisciplinary engagement in support of gaining efficiencies in the management of ty all types of Indian energy and mineral management on trust land nationwide. Um, having the four agencies um, housed in one um, office offers a cost effective solution and we provide a centralized and multifunctional processing capacity. Uh, and this helps to ensure the department's uh, successful fulfillment of its Indian energy and mineral development responsibilities in the face of fluctuating workloads um, and during the times of COVID where um, things are out of the norm for most agencies and field offices. Um, the IESC staff consists of subject matter experts and we bring the needed uh, capacity to all phases of mineral and energy leasing management processes um, from start to finish. Uh, the IESC fulfills the priorities of the new administration, the department, and through Secretary Holland on behalf of tribes and uh, trust beneficiaries. Uh, as I said, uh, the IESC works on nationwide trust issues. Uh, we coordinate with our sister agencies um, internal with BIA. And then we also coordinate with our federal partners and tribes. Um, so if you go back one slide, please. Um, this just basically shows how our office is made up. We have the four agencies housed within the Indian Energy Service Center, um, and then each of the core four functions. And then we also have uh, partnerships uh, in the forms of memorandums of understanding and M MOAs uh, with the Department of Energy, EPA, um, IEED, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and the U.S. Army, uh, US Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, and we partner with them on expediting and working out issues of any oil and gas and mineral um, leasing and development as needed. Okay, next slide, please. Um, as we stated, we support Indian energy, renewable and conventional uh, development, development and management nationwide. Um, so we have two main functional areas that we operate under, uh, like I said, departmental coordination, fulfilling the roles and the priorities of the department, which includes um, tribal consultation, um, tribal outreach, making sure we're filling the trust responsibilities of the department through our four agencies um, and making sure that we are uh, expediting um, and implementing new policies and procedures on behalf of the department. Um, which also includes processing support. We provide aid and direct services and support to our federal partners um, in the forms of we receive referrals from our um, agency and field offices, regional offices and state offices nationwide. Um, from there, we can assess um, how we can assist those offices in providing um, better and expedited services and helping um, our agency and field offices catch up on any backlogs. Um, outdated work um, and any unusual or new priorities that are coming down uh, through the department. Our office also um, hosts and updates um, the SOP. Uh, if you can go back one slide, please. The standard operating procedures, um, which is the, the handbook that is through the Department of the Interior. Uh, there are various attachments to the SOP. Um, our office, the Indian Energy Service Center, hosts um, nationwide trainings for federal partners and for tribes to attend. And then we're also delegated the responsibility to provide um, nationwide updates. And so the attachment A, uh, we currently released um, an updated version of fluid minerals. And then we're continuing to work on an update as needed. Um, attachment C, solid minerals, attachment F, IMDAs. Attachment H, renewable energy, and the newest attachment is attachment I, and that is regarding um, tribal energy 
resource agreements in tribal energy development organizations, and that's a new attachment um, that falls in line with the new <clears throat> Terra and Tito uh, policies and procedures that um, have been recently implemented um, throughout the department. Okay, next slide, please. On behalf of the Indian Energy Service Center, um, we have ready, uh, issued a ready initiative, which is renewable energy accelerated deployment initiative. Um, and this is on behalf of Indian country nationwide. Um, as we stated, um, we looked at the action items and the priorities of the new administration. And one of the action items that we created through our federal partners in our four um, home agencies is that the department should take immediate and proactive measures to increase implementation uh, regarding renewable energy for Indian lands. And this is through uh, the standard operating procedures, the handbook that we operate um, and update for attachment age, like I said, was renewable energy resource development on Indian lands. Um, from that, we reached out to our federal partners and the action that we proposed was that we develop a structured effort for a proactive um, implementation of renewable energy on Indian lands. This allows us to coordinate with our federal partners um, and so make sure our policies and procedures um, are updated. We know the uh, regulations need to be updated and any IAMs or any handbooks and making sure they're consistent across Indian country um, and then also with the department and our federal partners. So with that, the next steps that we decided we will dis uh, disseminate information related to attachment H, including um, the current content, um, proposing um, updated content, and then also um, doing a review and comment period um, where we can uh, receive input, uh, make sure we have updated language that falls in line with any um, regulations or policies, and then also work with our tribes to get their input as well. Um, you know, we consider any tribal outreach that we uh, perform as government to government relationships. And, you know, we know that we'll have to coordinate with our tribal leaders um, and our tribal governments to make sure that we have um, consistency across um, nationwide issues. And we also plan to do follow up discussions and and then once we are ready to um, issue uh, any final policies, um, provide training and have that uh, one on one with each of our tribal leaders. So part of the ready for Indian country elements. Um, include, you know, doing the enhanced outreach, reaching out to tribes, uh, performing um, one on ones, and then also being able to walk through the process and procedures that we are recommending to uh, implement throughout the department and hoping to um, update. Um, any renewable energy development opportunities um, and hear from tribes on what um, their needs are. We also hope to do um, listening sessions um, with the tribes and with the individual uh, tribal beneficiaries and Indian owners, and then also um, doing regulatory updates, as we said, to streamline and enhance uh, any policies and procedures that are outdated um, and can be improved. This also allows potential uh, additional public resources and, like we said, coordinating with our federal partners who are involved um, in the same uh, energy and mineral uh, processing on behalf of the department and other federal agencies. And Carla, I'm just going to ask you to uh, wrap up pretty soon because I do want to make sure we have a lot of time for questions. No, nope, you're good. And I think I believe that is the last slide. Sorry to push you there, um, but that was great information. Um, and I'm sure people will be very thrilled that your office exists because it's a great resource and, and portal for folks to get more information and to kind of navigate all these processes. Um, so we are going to go to um, Q and A. Uh, I will just note that we do have folks on the call with a lot of different representation from Department of Interior, including folks on the call from the Division of Energy Minerals Development who didn't speak but are available. Um, before going to the Q and A itself, uh, which we already have a couple questions in the chat, um, I did wanted to give, as I said, um, Nicole Harshherder from the Tunisia. Ane um, is a great partner for us on the ground, 
and really uh, has been just very engaged on these issues, particularly around water uh, rights and access for, for years. I wanted to give Nicole a chance to um, just respond and maybe ask the first question. Um, and I should also note that um, Ben Nuvamsa from the Kiva Institute was an additional partner on the ground and just wasn't able to be here today. But Nicole, I wanted to turn it over to you for a, a couple minutes and then we'll go to questions. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Nicole Horsherder. I am the director of an organization, we're based on Black Mesa. We formed to address the impacts of coal mining, namely the depletion of the aquifers and the water sources by the coal mining industry. While we're focused at the moment on more on commercial scale renewable energy development as a response to transitioning away from um, the now closed coal fire power plants, um, that I think it's equally important to provide um, the many thousands of homes across the Navajo Nation who lack power to be able to receive inexpensive or power at no cost, uh, reliable energy. Um, and we're thinking um, mainly of solar energy. I think it's imperative that we continue to focus and move with intention and urgency towards clean non-nuclear and renewable energy, non-nuclear energy, but renewable energy and away from fossil fuel. For decades, we've de dedicated, those of us who live on Black Mesa, we've dedicated precious water sources to the coal mine industry, which has benefited communities outside the reservation, uh, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, Phoenix. Today, we lack the water to continue to support continued fossil fuel development and expansion. We are the only tribes in Arizona, Navajo being the largest, and Hopi, that still have no water rights in Arizona. While the upper basin Colorado River was waived to support the NGS for the duration of its operation, having it returned to the Navajo Nation has turned out to be very complicated. Even though it was both verbally and promised and written in the original resolutions and of the leases, Arizona still hasn't begun its effort to relinquish that water to the Navajo Nation. Likewise, the Navajo Aquifer, deep within the Black Mesa Plateau, the only potable source of water to both Navajos and Hopis that live on Black Mesa, was used to support the Peabody operation, which supplied coal to the Navajo generating station. To say today, seeps and springs all over the plateau have disappeared. According to the recent USGS reports, there is a sign of slight recovery in only a few wells since Peabody has stopped pumping the aquifers. This is a clear sign that Peabody has had the most impact on the aquifer levels. It would be nice to begin using the aquifer for economic development now that the mine is no longer pumping the aquifers, but hydrologists have made it clear that full recovery of the aquifer could be as long as 20 years or more from now. We have really jeopardized the foundation on which our communities and our people exist which is water, by both allowing tribal government to agree to the leasing the water, but to also allow the protection of the water to rest with the Department of Interior, our trustee and its agencies, was a big mistake. Moving forward, we need to tap into the resources and expertise that the federal agencies have available to us today. We have to get creative and drive economic development and the projects that mitigate economic and environmental impacts of coal impacted communities towards that of a sustainable development and water protection. Essentially, one that doesn't destroy the permanent homeland of the Navajo people and the Hopi people. I think whatever it is that we come up with, and we're going to have to work hard, we're going to have to work with intention, that this plan is would be an excellent blueprint for the rest of the nation. Um, I want, um, I don't necessarily have um, a, a more specific question, but what I want to say is that if, if any of what I said is something that the federal agencies that that presented today um, definitely feel like they can um, move some of their expertise and their funds in our direction um, and are motivated to do that, I would um, love to work 
um, and become a partner to the agency to help the communities that I work with, the coal impacted communities, uh, transition um, out of uh, the, the fossil fuel um, economy that we've been uh, locked in for so long. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole. And uh, and I will just echo, um, uh, first, I am sorry for really not doing a great job with the name of your organization. I will work on it. Um, second, I wanted to say to the federal agencies working in this region that Nicole is really an important partner um, and very connected on the ground and just highly recommend that you make that connection. Um, I know we are running a little short of time. I want to make sure we have room for some of the questions that have come in. Uh, the first one, I think, is a really good question that's really directed at BLM. Um, and, and I should say, I, once again, if this is on your screen, but um, if you are phoning in, please hit star three to raise your hand and be unmuted. If you are on the computer, please press that smiley icon at the bottom to raise your hand. Otherwise, put your question in the chat. Um, so a BLM question that I think is a great one um, is uh, how can communities engage with BLM to develop and implement recreation projects, many of which will rely on access to both tribal and BLM lands? And I actually want to expand that to um, question to also be a mining, mine rec service mine reclamation question, because one of the things that we know uh, many communities are thinking about is mine reclamation and then repurposing that land and thinking about things like recreation you know, agriculture in some cases, um, solar in some cases, but that kind of combination of reclamation and reuse seems like both the uh, um, OSMRE and a BLM question, but I'll start with BLM. Uh, sure, uh, I'm gonna see if Jerry wants to take this since he operates in a state and probably has more experience on this, but uh, just to say that that is a goal of the AML program, um, as noted before, to turn it, return it to beneficial use, whatever that use is. Um, and Jerry, do you have more to say on this? Yeah, thanks, Kate and Susan. Uh, ab absolutely. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the best way to work with BLM on whatever it is, is to, to honestly engage with the local field manager that's uh, responsible for the administration of the public lands that might be subject. Um, and if that's like a, a tribal recreation project that might have crossover onto public lands, you know, I would absolutely say that BLM is is very interested in engaging with, um, you know, whoever those stakeholders are, whether that's tribes or cities or any other type of type of uh, groups or NGOs that are developing recreation projects. You know, so we can look at trail interconnectivity and uh, whether that's physical or legal access to recreation sites to be able to provide those opportunities um, for the variety of of uh, you know different folks that we have across the the state and and visitors, um, so I believe the BLM is going to have another call for Dingle Act access project nominations um, this coming January, which will get posted for public nominations for um, if there's public lands that uh, you know tribes or or anybody in the public knows of that do not have legal access or that. Um, you know, don't have physical access for that matter. You know, they're they're landlocked. You can't get to them, or other than hiking or whatever. Then that'll be a really great opportunity to nominate those projects, and those projects will then get wrapped into BLM's um, basically our our ten year plan for um, unlocking those those acreage per the goals stated in in the Dingle Act. Thanks so much um, to both of you. And I don't know if um, OSMRE wants to add anything just about, you know, I think one of the challenges for communities is, is, is there so many of us at different agencies and sort of what if you have a, you know, a build back better regional grant proposal that requires you to do mine reclamation and think about building something new and that might be an energy project. And then you're trying to deal with you guys at OSMRE and then also with AML and also with DOE and also with EDA and sort of how do you on your end, kind of help facilitate that kind of interaction across all those agencies. Matt, do you want to take that one? Um, well, the, the, the two parts there, um, j just first to, to say that the AMLA program absolutely does apply across the board for both reclamation and the development sides again. So 
um, or or uh, either or. Um, but in terms of uh, how to best apply that across uh, funding from different agencies, um, the this it, it's probably just going to be based on specific uh, scenarios for the project and and where those other funds come from. So if funds from one source might work better uh, to apply toward a particular aspect of the project and uh, Ambler funds are, are better for a different part. Um, th there can be some uh, optimization of how, how that is applied um, without having a specific example. It's tough to say anything more. Um, and I see Sterling is on the call as well. So I don't know if Sterling, if you have anything you wanted to add as well. No, not really. You um, hit on the specifics. You know, he's right. It's based on really um, project specific um, activities and, and those different funding sources that are, are part of that. The, the, Pick myself the project. So, I mean, normally when someone submits a project, and and I mean, we 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 have the opportunity to work through what the scoping is and, and what you're looking to do and make sure it meets that criteria, and then we'll make it work. Thanks both. And, you know, I think this is something that we, uh, those of us working on the interagency work group are very committed to is trying to figure out how to make it easier actually to work across all these agencies when you have a, you know, economic development projects in particular span all kinds of different agencies and different issues. And we are trying to make it easier to um, access those and not have to do 17 different applications. We're not quite there yet, but uh, you know, the EDA funding is a great kind of first step and then bringing in others um, on top of that. I have one uh, other question, AML question, which is really, do, do, does the AML office, like does the Hopi AML office have a specific budget? Is there budget for Navajo? Is there like, are there targeted pots of money in the AML fund for specific communities? For for us, yes. The So each, each tribe has 3.33 million each year. Um, so uh, uh, Navajo Nation has projects uh, allocated for uh, 6.6 .6 of that already uh, and, and have two, uh, two funding years that do not have projects allocated yet. And Hopi Tribe uh, does not have any projects allocated yet for, for any of their fiscal years. So uh, there's opportunity for, uh, for projects there. Perfect. So yeah, 3.3. That's that's uh that's not nothing. So thank you so much for that. I um hate to do this, but uh we did run over a little, so I need to 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 end the DOI QA. Um we're gonna have a, one more QA opportunity that's gonna have to go pretty quick. But uh before that, um I know that broadband is just a critical issue to absolutely everybody on this call, and I wanted to give an opportunity our partners at the Department of Commerce's National Telecom and Information Administration, NTIA, to speak briefly on, on those opportunities. It's a huge priority of this administration to provide more access to broadband. So turning it over to, I don't know if it's Fedeskia who's starting. Thank you, Kate. Uh, this is this is Gabriel Montoya. Um, I'd like to start out with, with introductions, but uh, first, uh, President Nez and uh, Chairman Nwangima, thank you so much for giving us this opportunity. Uh, we'll be as quick as possible because we know you probably have some important questions. Uh, but my name is Gabriel Montoya. I am a broadband program specialist with NTIA. Um, I am from the Pueblo of Powake here in Northern New Mexico, and I am working from my home to be able to represent tribes in the United States. Uh, Vanessa, would you introduce yourself, please? Yes, great. Thank you. Uh, my name is Vanessa Crushy, and I'm also a, a broadband program specialist and originally from the Four Corners area. So being able to participate in today's presentation, it's, um, it's awesome. And it's also personal, given that a lot of the projects that are being discussed would directly benefit my community, my family. So thank you for this opportunity to uh, share a little bit about our, um, our project. So we're going to talk a little bit about the tribal broadband connectivity program. Uh, the one of the benefits of the program is that just to start off is that we did a tribal consultation. We had 13 hours of tribal consultation to really spin on a whole different programming. 
NTIA took it seriously. They hired a tribal team and they, and here we are implementing this tribal grant program. Next. So the Consolidated uh, Appropriations Act of 2021 allowed for three different funding sources. It was a tribal broadband connectivity grant. There was the broadband infrastructure deployment grant and the connecting minority communities pilot program. The one we're here to talk about today is the tribal broadband connectivity grant that that authorized <clears throat> excuse me grants to do broadband on tribal lands uh remote learning telework telehealth and this came out of the covid response uh we were allocated 980 million for that next slide please um the tribal broadband connectivity program had a very open uh allocation of who could apply it included tribal governments colleges universities it had some areas in there for Hawaiian as well as Alaska and tribal organizations were also allowed to apply. It was for broadband use, whether it was going to be uh, remote learning, telework, workforce development or telehealth resources. And the grant closed on September 1st, 2021. The eligible uses under uh, statute allowed for broadband infrastructure deployment including the support and establishment of carrier neutral submarine cable landing stations, which is important for some tribes who don't have the, the infrastructure to be able to get that um, affordable broadband programs, whether the tribes are looking at free or reduced costs, broadband services, or to prevent disconnection of their, of their broadband service altogether. Distance learning, telehealth, digital inclusion efforts, and broadband adoption activities were also included. Um, and at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Vanessa. Thank you. Thank you, Gabe. So we have a number of resources on our <clears throat> Broadband USA website. Um, the link and the address is on top of this slide. But there are a number of resources on this website uh, that may be a benefit to you as you think about your um, broadband um, planning for how you would be able to use broadband in future um, instances or funding opportunities. Next slide. And so for those who have um, submitted a grant and are interested in knowing where our timeline is at, applications were submitted um, by September 1st and that was a deadline. Um, and now we are in the review process. So we have to follow the review process as outlined in the NOFO. And there's a three part process. There's eligibility review, a merit review, and a programmatic review. Right now, we are in the eligibility review process to determine all of the applicants who are eligible for the funding opportunity. Then we'll move into the selection process, and that's where the Assistant Secretary of Commerce will select and re recommend applications for funding to the grants officer. Um, we expecting to uh, select and process awards by November 29th of this year with an expected start date um, to be December 13th at the earliest. Um, we are diligently, diligently working on our end to ensure that we try to meet these deadlines as much as possible. The next slide, please. Um, this is a list of our tribal team contact. Um, many of us are located, we're all located throughout the United States, um, but this is a list of our team and our email addresses where we can be reached um, if you have any further questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was so efficient. Um, really appreciate you. Uh, and highlighting those opportunities. And I think I am the final person and I'm gonna try to be very, very brief um, as I know we are running over a bit. So let me just do, I'm only gonna do just a few slides. Um, hang on one sec. All right, can you see that? All right, now can you see that? And somebody? confirm or yes. deny. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so uh, just really quickly, Department of Energy, where I am a senior advisor, um, uh, is, is relevant to many, I think, of the things that communities, um, and particularly uh, in this region and, and, and tribal communities are paying attention to, which is the opportunity to uh, revitalize the economy with a focus on the transition to the clean energy economy and onto new and more sustainable and more resilient 
energy opportunities. Um, we have a real commitment at the Department of Energy on putting people back to work. Um, our secretary says jobs, jobs, jobs all the time. Um, but, but as you heard earlier from EDA about job quality, making sure that those are not just green jobs, but good jobs uh, with pathways into those jobs, particularly for those who may have been left out of the of the energy economy to date. So we really are very, very focused. Our secretary is obsessed with um, the idea of clean energy creating jobs and of supporting and working directly with communities to do that. We have several offices that um, have ongoing investment and programs and expertise in areas that may be of interest as you're developing out EDA proposals or other proposals or, or, or visions for uh, the future of these communities and this and your economies. Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management, Office of Electricity, Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, or EERE, and the Loan Program Office. I'm going to say just a few words about each of those. Um, and sorry for all the words on the slide, but the EERE um, is really our office of kind of the clean energy future, um, really focused on a huge range from bioenergy and that sustainable bioenergy, uh, which is an opportunity in many places because of the potential for feedstock um, uh, from, from lands or from forests to be used for things like sustainable aviation fuel uh, through sustainable processes like pyrolysis. Uh, hydrogen fuel cells, geothermal, um, water technologies, which just to Nicole's point is incredibly important, water reclamation, water reuse, desalination, pump storage, weatherization, uh, of course, and then advanced manufacturing across all those areas. Fossil energy and carbon management, the name has been changed. It used to just be fossil energy. Now fossil energy and carbon management, really looking at Carbon capture, carbon sequestration, permanent sequestration opportunities, looking at carbon, um, uh, low carbon industrial supply chains. How do we decarbonize existing industrial processes? How do we think about hydrogen, clean hydrogen, reduce methane emissions, reduce other emissions from existing industry? And then to the point about AML, um, advancing critical minerals and rare earth elements. There are mines. Uh, that can continue to be active and support the clean energy economy. And there's mines that can and should be remediated and reclaimed. So we're really looking at um, DOE supporting across those areas. Uh, and then of course, the energy water nexus. Ener water is scarce and it takes a lot of energy to produce water. These things are in inextricably linked. We do a lot of work in that area as well. Office of Electricity, um, this is really where we focus on the grid. As you all know, transmission, and you just heard, transmission is critical to just about every economic strategy that anyone is ever talking about. Transition and energy production, affordable, clean, accessible energy. Uh, it's very hard to have an economy without those things. In fact, it's probably impossible in this day and age. So we are very focused on working with our partners, including NTIA, on, on, on transmission, on technology, on grids, on microgrids. Um, and then our loan program office is important because, you know, this is not, this is where we really leverage private investment and we work with companies across um, the U.S. and the world, frankly, to, uh, to invest in places that are trying to create jobs, that are trying to create opportunity across a huge range of technologies. One of the really exciting things about the loan program office is a renewed focus on fossil asset repurposing. So if you have a power plant that is or is going to soon be offline, what can that be used for? That infrastructure tends to have great transmission access and transportation access and ideally water access. But are there new and cleaner and more sustainable opportunities for those sites? Um, that's And also for mine sites, these are things that that, that the loan program office is laser focused on. I'm gonna skip that, that slide and just say, you know, DOE is, is sometimes hard to access. I'm super excited and I can't say too much, but tomorrow we are actually launching a new pilot project at DOE that's going to provide much more um, consistent and easier access to our experts across the agency and to um, a way into the programs I just talked about that will have a, a specific focus on um, on fossil communities or energy communities um, like yours. So along with environmental justice and pollution burden communities. So excited about that. Um, keep, keep you all posted on that program as it moves, but also you can just connect with me um, or with Briggs who started the call 
and we can connect you to the right people. You can follow us on these sites here, the fedconnect.gov for funding notifications. I will put in the chat a more specific notification for um, funding across DOE, but we are here to, you know, anchor your economic development strategy if what you want is to develop an energy strategy. DOE is here to help, and we work very closely with EDA to make that happen. So I'm going to leave it at that. That was a very quick taste, um, but uh, we don't have a lot of time. In fact, we're a little bit over time. So um, given that, I know we are supposed to do one more round of questions. I want to ask my friends, um, whether we can still do that. Can we do maybe five minutes of questions, uh, do we think, and then and then turn to closing remarks? I'm asking Briggs, I guess. Well, let's see if there's any out there. Awesome. Thank you. I hope I stopped sharing my screen. I now can't see anybody anymore, so. <laughs> Nor can I see the chat anymore, so if, uh, if Briggs, if you see anything, please let me know because I have lost my ability to see what's happening on the screen. <laughs> All right, I'm I'm not seeing anything in the chat right now. Okay, thank you. Um, and and I just want to say again, thank you to everyone. I think we've given a lot of opportunities to uh, to weigh in. I hope that's been useful. Um, I think what you've heard is great new opportunities from EDA great new opportunities to leverage other federal resources, and we are here to help. And with that, I'm just gonna turn it over uh, to my great colleague, Wahela, for a couple of closing remarks, and then back to Briggs to adjourn. Wahela. Thank you, Kate. Um, wow, what a wonderful uh, two hours. And that we had today, and um, if you all don't know me, I'm Wahela Johns. I'm uh, with the Office of Indian Energy and um, at DOE and been appointed in this position for about nine months and learning so much. And um, of course, this administration has huge commitments on um, addressing climate change, but also um, addressing equity at the center and the core. And um, just wanted to mention that because this is why we are here today is to um, provide uh, overview of, or a snapshot of every federal agency and offices uh, resources. And um, my name, uh, or not my name, but I'm actually, I didn't introduce myself. I am from uh, these communities, um, Navajo and Hopi, in Black Mesa region, I'm Diné, and uh, from an area called Huamjone. And um, to have this event happen uh, today is a huge milestone. I think in this um, time that we're in in, in transition, um, but also um, bridging these connections with this administration and their support and resources that are being made available <clears throat> to tribes like Navajo and Hopi. Um, so this this um, event and this initiative is is close to me because I um, live about uh, two miles from the coal mining operations and have had lots of relatives that lost jobs there um, and also at the NGS and site and then also uh, have seen the impacts environmentally um, but also just the the challenges um, economically and want to make sure that. Um, as a uh, in this role that I am helping to coordinate and pull together as many uh, partners within the federal family, but also um, the connection I have within my community, the connection I have with all of you that participated today and that listened in. And this is just one um, step or kind of an intro to um, this initiative, the interagency working group. And so I appreciate President Nez and um, Hopi Chairman, and also um, uh, everybody that um, Briggs to Kate to um, Brian, Mr. Anderson, and every, every I mean, Nettle uh, for helping out to coordinate this um, webinar or this um, session because, it, again, it's, it is the beginning, and I feel like 
there was a lot there and we will follow up um, with you all um, on next steps. And if you have questions, like Kate said, you can reach out to us. And with the Office of Indian Energy, we do have, um, we have a listserv that we do all of the kind of announcements on funding opportunities. So what Kate just mentioned um, around this next funding opportunity for community specific place space is tomorrow, um, which is really exciting. And so um, to get on our listservs, we keep up all of the funding announcements on our listserv. But if you need to reach me and our office, we are available and I'll put it in the chat. Um, and again, I'm, I'm here just to be of assistance to all of you um, that participated in today's call. So, and, and um, session. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wahela. No, and I'll, and I'll just say really quickly what a great partner. Wahela and the office of Indian energy have been on this event and in general, um, uh, uh, she was able to be, as you heard from president Nez in. The region recently um, up in Farmington, and it really has been just a huge priority for us to to provide as much and uh, many touch points and as much access to these programs to your communities as we can. So thank you, Wahela, for everything you're doing to make that happen. Briggs, over you for the final word. Well, thank you, Wahela, for those uh, great comments. I mean, what a wonderful context and way to end the meeting on. Uh, and also, you provided a couple of thank yous that I was going to do as well, which Leaves me with thank yous to our partners on the ground. Uh, we couldn't have put this on without you, so thank you so much for that. And all the attendees here today, thank you for your engagement. And we really would like to follow up with you, so please do reach out to us. We're here to help. Um, and with that, you know, the slides and the recording will be available. We'll send that out to you in email format, and it'll also be posted on the website. And please do reach out to us. We're here to help. So uh, with that, that concludes our event, and thank you so much for participating. Thank you, everybody.